everyone has heard of King John. The tyrant forced to go to war with his barons, leading to the signing of the Magna Carta. People probably know him from Robin Hood or other Hollywood productions. But I'm not here to delve into the realms of mythology, hearsay or legend. My mission is to unveil the man behind the myth. Who was King John? It was 1208. King John had overplayed his hand. So used to getting his own way, and so determined to place John de Grey as Archbishop of Canterbury, he had manoeuvred himself into a dangerous gambit that failed. It was check and mate. The Pope had placed an interdict on the kingdom on the 24th of March, on the eve of the Annunciation of the Blessed Mary. And on a Sunday, the church bells had sounded for the last time. Now, I stated before it was an unknown Sunday. I'll explain. The 24th was a Monday, the feast day a Tuesday. So, did the bells ring for the last time on the 23rd, which was a Sunday, or the following week. Most people agree on the 23rd, but hear me out. If the bells rung on the 23rd, then contemporary historians wouldn't be saying the interdict occurred on the 24th. Wendover, Paris, Cockershaw, all say the 24th was the interdict date. So why were the church bells rung the day before? In a day and age without the internet, it makes much more sense to have it the following week. I doubt the monks would have had the memo sitting around on their desk for weeks on end before suddenly acting. More likely, it arrived and they implemented it immediately with effect. And these things take time. Anyway, on with the story. Funnily enough, Coggershaw neglects to mention that his order, the Circeans, actually ignored the prohibition, but, but, but he's outed by Wendover, who explains that the white monks were given permission by the abbot to continue on as normal, and the Pope, in disbelief, shut it right down. Naughty monks. Either way, all sacraments were at an end, no rites. Effectively, the church was on strike. Only John could put an end to this purgatory. And it doesn't look like he gave a damn. If anything, he doubled down, on par with a certain Tudor chap, only without the support of a religious reformation. There was no alternative to turn to. Simply put, John's buggered. The kingdom with him. He loots the churches, the cathedrals. Priests flee. He's on a rampage. He's only making it worse for himself, much worse. If he wants to send a message to the Pope, John's certainly doing so, a negative one. He's seized hostages from his magnates, all bar William de Bros. But the deal with Arthur boiling to the surface and causing the King to demand his arrest. But let's explore another powder keg from a cauldron that's been bringing to boil for some years now of the situation in Ireland. We know from early on that John treated Meath, a part of Ireland, like a frat boy in a party, pulling beards, being a general pillock. Those days had long gone. Various magnates now control Ireland. For instance, William Marshall had been given Leinster and sent to Ireland in 1206, following his spat with the King. These lands were far from tame, with politics being localised and irrelevant to the story of King John. Until now, as the continent had been lost, a bar a few domains that had been won back recently. 
John slowly turns his gaze back to Ireland. Now, let's backtrack a year. By now, the usual suspects are here. Walter de Lassie, William Marshall and William de Bros. All holding their areas, along with the Judicia, Myler, Fitzhenry. Already, there had been problems with de Bros's seneschal over in Ireland, and Geoffrey Marsh, who is quarrelling with de Lassie. The usual politics. However, by now, Fitzhenry was on a power trip. He's an old school settler. His family had been beating up the Irish since the conquest. Uh, he wasn't a fan of these new magnates. Friends of the king and being given Irish lands after the loss of the continent. Uh, for example, the marshal, as I said, had Leinster. And Milo Henry also had lands in Leinster, such as Dunamans Castle. It was inevitable they'd clash. Clash they did. And Fitzhenry starts sending letters to the king to undermine the marshal. Remember, the marshal and the king were indifferent at this period in time, and the marshal's son is still a political hostage to John. All the veteran can do is protest against Myla and defend his lands to the best of his ability. This does nothing to stop Myla Fitzhenry, though. If anything, it emboldens him. He starts to wrest lands from other magnates. De Bros has Limerick. Fitzhenry takes Limerick. No doubt encouraged by the Marshal. Walter de Lassie retaliated on de Bros's behalf, even besieging the Justicia. Now, everyone was getting involved. John isn't happy, so demands to know what the problem is. He summons the Marshal, de Lassie, and Broas to Woodstock in England to discuss a solution, a cruel ruse. The John's solution being thus, while the magnates all meet in England, Fitzhenry was all set to unite Ireland for John and take the magnates' land. As for the magnates, they can lump it. Utterly despicable, and John certainly rubbed it in. Enter three knights. John of Early, Jordan of Sogerville, and Stephen of Evreux. They had a dilemma. Agree to John's summons and forfeit lands because they were on the side of the Marshal. But by now, they'd no doubt that Marshal and the others had been betrayed at Woodstock, and Myla was ruthless. However, their lord, the Marshal, they respected above all else. John of Early makes a magnificent speech, full of chivalry, dedication and honour, filthy, not a cur among them. In a nutshell, the three knights made a declaration, a legal loophole. Uh, they were basically saying that they could not obey the king's summons to Woodstock, as it would break their oath of fidelity to the marshal. A highly serious matter. This was the age of chivalry after all. The height of chivalry, in fact. They were not going to abandon their law's domain. Myla Fitzhenry now had a real fight on his hands. Apparently, when John heard of this, he gloated to the marshal that his forces, along with the Knights Three, were crushed. Many lives were lost. Uh, before, later, admitting he had no idea what was going on, had made it all up. Not cool. In reality, all hell was breaking loose in Ireland, with Marshall's wife, Isabella, holding the fort against Fitzhenry. The Knights Three had allied with de Bros as well as de Lassie's household in Meath. Myla, Fitzhenry, was expecting an easy victory with a magnate Scott. Instead, he met heavy resistance and heavy losses. This requires the king to send a decree in early 1208 to all sailors in Wales not to sail. Instead, they'll transport the king and his army across the Irish Sea. Any sailors who failed to comply with the king's wishes would be hanged. 
the king was clearly livid. To make matters worse, Milo Fitzhenry gets defeated, taken prisoner. He is forced to hand his eldest son to Countess Isabella as a hostage. True ladylike behaviour. Oh, don't be fooled. 13th century women were not submissive waifs who spent all their time knitting. <laughs> the Victorians need a tap on the wrist for that one. No, Isabella, aided by good counsel, had crushed the judicia. Oh, and she was pregnant at the time. Just thought I'd mention it. Carrying on. The king had no option but to step down. The incursion to Ireland halted. Threats ceased. He still had to deal with the marshal, though, who had remained in England, letting his wife do all the work. Full faith in her. The two men, William Marshall and the king, met in Bristol. John wants to know what the bloody hell is going on. Marshall simply tells the truth. He feared that while away, Milo would take his land. He doesn't accuse the king of deceit. Merely tells him it was a matter of honour. Marshall, as per usual, acted logically and to strengthen the throne, no matter his feelings of the king. His loyalty was to the throne. The result? He got back in favour, returning to Ireland in April 1208. Greeted by his knights three, who risked the king's wrath for honour. Though the next day, he was in Kilkenny, meeting his triumphant wife, a carving her want of revenge against Myla Henry. Yeah, she was on quite the rampage. And Marshall himself is no spring chicken. He's around 60 years of age by now. Still in the saddle, and still clad in mail, but he's a veteran of many campaigns. He served three kings over his long life. Hopefully now he can hang up his halberg and retire. Pay a bit of scutage. Let's give a man a break. And this is where our story rejoins, as John's main focus was on Stephen Langton, supposed to be the Archbishop of Canterbury, not quite getting the job in John's eyes, and John de Grey, the man who John wanted as Archbishop of Canterbury, and Pope Innocent III. The whole affair enrages John. He's looting the churches, punishing the church. He's on a rampage. Milo Fitzhenry wasn't in his good books either, and thus begins his replacement by John de Grey. At least the king seems to have given up trying to make de Grey Archbishop of Canterbury. Instead, de Grey, already Bishop of Norwich, seems prepped for Ireland. Anyway, short story long, John is taking hostages from his magnates. Do remember that hostages are a tradition, a test of loyalty. Remember that chap in Game of Thrones, Greyjoy, who lived with the stars? Though the child isn't in danger, unless the father is incredibly disloyal, it's just a tradition. But here, John really shows his dark side, and the barons had real reason not to hand over their children as hostages. How can he keep unharmed our dear children, who had cruelly slaughtered his own nephew, and the kind of death which we call murder with his own hand? That was the argument. Nor is de Bros the only one who refuses. In Nottingham, John forced a number of innocent children to become hostages. One boy was called Herod, and the poor kid was hanged by the neck on the gallows.
a noble boy killed out of John's hatred for his own barons. But it wasn't just the hostages. John was issuing fines, robbing people of their possessions. He defloured magnates' daughters, lusted over their wives, took them occasionally. He forbade anyone to hunt in his forests. Utterly detestable behaviour. It took him a long while, 40 years in fact, but he finally became the tyrant people feared. In the spring of 1208, William de Bras, however, was still on the naughty step and not willing to face the king. He's hiding away in Wales. Wales, I hear you say? Last time you told us he went to Ireland. Oh, I'm getting to that. A string of unfortunate events doom William de Bras. But anyway, the king arrives in Wales to meet Bras. But William isn't there. And so his wife Maud conducted the meeting. If this went well, if de Bros turned up and faced the king, his old friend, remember de Bros was a favourite of the king, maybe this would all blow over. It could end. Unfortunately, this wasn't to be. She tells John she'd never give up her son to the man who killed Arthur. Not a wise thing to do. So John takes the eldest son as hostage anyway. A short time later, de Brose eventually appears before the king, probably terrified as to what would happen. The king forced him to surrender his Welsh lands, confiscating Brecon, Hay and Radnor as well as paying a thousand marks to Gerard of Athy, the Sheriff of Gloucester, for costs of sorting out the mess. His son was released as a hostage, but only in exchange of six others. Imagine having to decide which members of your family would be surrendered to John, given de Bros knew exactly what happened to Arthur. So, it was all over, right? The two men had made peace. Not really. The king would complain he owed money. And according to John's own records, this was certainly true. It seemed to be all about money. Plain and simple, at least on parchment. Right, magnates in debt was nothing new, and most defaulted on payments anyway. Being in debt to the king was pretty much a tradition. But de Broos seems to be the exception. He didn't appear to be paying any of his debts off. His Limerick estates had racked up a huge amount of money. But other magnates were also being called in to cough up debts, and John was grubbier than ever. Robert de Vupont was forced to give up hostages at 4,000 miles. Another chap connected to Arthur of Britain, who was in charge of Ruined Castle around the time Arthur died. Yes, de Bros and Vupont had debts, but they were possibly being treated with bias, even taking in mind John's new laws to rake in cash. Robbery, as Wendover puts it. I'm not going to delve into conspiracy theories, but de Bros certainly knew about Arthur's fate and we don't need Alex Jones to connect the dots. If anything, John was covering his ass legally. His claims of debt's just a smokescreen. It is clear that all these accusations led back to Arthur, a genuine medieval conspiracy. But as usual with conspiracy theories, they miss the bigger picture. You see, John still had that two year truce with Philip of France, and it wouldn't last forever. In fact, it would end in October 1208 and John would need money to finance a new full-scale invasion to wrest his lands back from Philip Augustus. He also needed to keep check of his own private funds. To keep control of this money, he enlisted Peter de Roche, the Bishop of Winchester, who controlled the chamber, a new financial body which travelled up and down the country with the king. Now, William de Roche had turned his back on the king over Arthur, not Peter. Peter was loyal 
He was not your average quill pusher either. He was a formidable soldier and handy in a siege. Allegedly, he was better at taking castles than preaching the word of the Lord. Allegedly. On a side note, Peter de Roche had an old friend from his hometown, the ruin, named Gerard Yathi, the Sheriff of Gloucester who I mentioned earlier. The chap who, winning the brawls, has just given a thousand marks to. Anyway, this exchequer travelled wherever the king went, and John started using tougher enforcement. He was certainly collecting all the debts, that much was clear, all the way up the country. It wasn't all about Arthur and political control. Now John had diverted his failed island effort back to Philip and France. De Bros would have to wait. The usual threats to the usual ship captains, John plans to muster at Portsmouth on the 1st of June 1208. Only this appears to have been ignored. On the departure date, nothing occurs. John arrives in May to oversee the effort and bugger all is happening. He takes his revenge on the sink ports. Brutal revenge. According to Gavas of Canterbury, he hanged the main culprits. And take in mind, this isn't the drop and snap. This is the kick off the plank Tyburn jig affair. Nasty. Some were simply ran through, put to the sword. Others were slung in irons, imprisoned, and ransomed later for coin. And a thousand marks are recorded as collected in Singport's records, so we know this happened. John tries again, but the truce over. Normandy will be taken. At least he hoped. This time in September, 1208. Only this doesn't go ahead either. He ends up redeploying the ships that did appear but not to France, to Wales. Why? De Bros was in full rebellion, taking his lands back and needed to be put down swiftly. Himself and two of his sons, William and Reginald, had set out to take Radnor, Hay and Brecon. It was perfectly timed, with all the important lords being elsewhere. They were dealing financially with Gerard Yathi, the Sheriff of Gloucester. Like I said, John was raking in the money. Still, the rebellion was unsuccessful. De Bros ends up failing to take any castles and buggers about in Leominster, eventually burning half the town to the ground. Gerard de Athi quashes the rebellion, crushing De Bros in a counter-offensive. De Bros's men were already deserting by this point. Their loyalty to the king overrode loyalty to a disgraced nobleman. The whole affair lasted barely two weeks. De Bros, now a fugitive, then flees Wales with his family across the Irish Sea. John's men hot on his heels, confiscating all his lands. Even the omens were against the fallen magnate, as the doomed De Bros was met with violent storms. With hindsight, he would have wished the sea had claimed them all. All this did, De Bros's flight, was create a vacuum. A chain reaction of events now occur. It all starts when John gives de Bros's lands to another magnate, Piers Fitzherbert. A Welsh prince took umbrage and attacked without hesitation. Now, like non-Norman Ireland, the Welsh had no uniting king. They had tribal leaders and princes, each feuding with local lords and each other. Each had their own alliances and political sway. Enter Prince Gwenwainwyn of Powys, who hated de Bros. And these were de Bros' lands, as far as he was concerned. He'd also had prior with King John, and was only just in John's good books. Gwenwainwyn swiftly took Brecon, and found himself crossing swords with Fitzherbert. Gwenwainwyn was also enemies with another Welsh prince, Llewellyn the Great. Of Gwynedd, a favourite of King John, who had also married John's illegitimate daughter, Joan. Llewellyn invades Powys, hoping to arrest it from Gwynwainwyn against John's wishes. John, as if no doubt guessed it, was having kittens. Everyone was to assist Fitzherbert. These lands needed defending, 
the king himself even made his way to Wales, stopping in Dorset on the way, there was now a real war on his hands. Thankfully, unlike the Broas, Gwen Wynwyn saw reason, and meets with the king face to face, submitting to John in Shrewsbury on October the 8th. These were not good terms, but the best he was going to get given John's mood. Twenty hostages were all handed over, all his lands were confiscated, his argument with the Bros really wasn't worth it. But Llewellyn also came out of this badly. He was no longer favourite, but unruly. At first, forgiving him, John soon changes his mind, ever mercurial. John planned to invade Wales. This didn't happen. Thankfully, peace was made with the two men. Llewellyn the Great got to keep his lands. But what did John make of all of this? All he wanted to do was invade France and get his lands back, but seemed thwarted at every turn. He wasn't used to this. He's only 40, more or less, been on a throne less than 10 years. Already he's making a mess of it. He abandons the Welsh border, leaving the martial lords to it, and makes his way back to London, Westminster. Philip Augustus, by the way, of France, did try attacking the Viscount of Thor once the truce ran out, but falls ill, abandoning his plans. So there was a bit of good luck for John after all. It seems also that Philip was having a rebellion of his own in Auvergne. Even the killing of a papal legate in Languedoc by Cathar heretics, it was all kicking off in France. There was even talk of crusade, although not to the Holy Land, but to France, to deal with the Cathar heretics. I can picture John rubbing his hands in glee. Maybe 1209 would be better. The year starts off brilliantly, despite the current predicament with the religious interdict. And in January, all issues in Wales were concluded to John's satisfaction. There is also a new royal birth on January the 5th, on a Monday, a son by the name of Richard, named after John's brother. Unlike Henry, who was born in Winchester, Richard's birthplace isn't really known and could be either Winchester Castle or Devizes in Wiltshire, and the birth appears to have had minor complications as poor Isabella of Aglium had convulsions of childbirth until the next day which was the epiphany. Thankfully, the Queen was okay. So was the child. Finally, the royal family is getting quite the brood. Legitimately this time, unlike John's half a dozen other bastards. While all this is going on, a John's moving his exchequer from Westminster to Northampton, apparently because of hatred for London. And by 1209, William de Broas, by the way, is in Marshall's lands in Leinster, hoping to seek refuge and treat with Walter de Lassie. His lands in Limbrick have been seized by the new Justicia of Ireland, John de Grey, the Bishop of Norwich. And Ireland isn't under interdict, by the way, I just thought I'd say that. And Myla, his predecessor, has fallen from grace. De Broas and his family have nowhere else to turn. Marshall's biographer mentions that King John had such a concurred hatred for de Broas that no peace could ever be made. Yet he doesn't mention the cause. As I said previously, the Marshall's histories are silent about what happened to Arthur. One thing is to be sure here though, it's a scandalous affair. At least John has given up on making the Bishop of Norwich, Archbishop of Canterbury, Stephen Langton, secure in that position, courtesy of the Pope. Oh, but the Pope would soon change John's mood. As in case you've forgotten, the kingdom is currently under an interdict. Now I said previously that John's excommunicated, but it's not as easy as that. The Pope has given an interdict. He's convinced that all John needed is a gentle nudge, a religious reminder. John 
would soon see reason and the prohibition could be lifted. Only almost a year on, nothing's changed. John was still being John. Messengers had been sent back and forth all throughout this chaos. John just didn't care. So the Pope escalates the threat. John will either comply or be cursed and cut off from the church, truly excommunicated, rather than the current interdict. And the Pope was watering things down, giving him chances, but this is damning. John had three months to comply or be expelled from the church. The bow is at full stretch, warns the Pope. The arrow won't turn back. Should this go ahead, all John's enemies could descend on the Kingdom of England with full sanction from the church. Yet John does climb down from his lofty heights, and although Stephen Langton is still barred from entering the Kingdom, his brother Simon was given safe conduct. At least progress is being made. In other matters, elsewhere, the Scottish King was aging. He's in his mid-sixties and having bouts of illness. Matters between the two stubborn men needed to be settled. For the best part of a decade, John has been putting off these meetings, dragging out and delaying talks. William the Lion still wanted Northumbria and John had no intention of handing it over. On April the 10th, John makes contact with the Lion, travelling north, far north, to Newcastle. Here the two kings meet, no doubt with feast and plenty of ale and wine. It finally looked like an agreement was emerging. Oh, the Scottish Lion headed back to Scotland to relay the message to his lords. Remember, the politics with Longshanks and Rob Roy are in the distant future. Here, the two kingdoms are equal in reign, sovereign states. The real problem, as ever, were the borders, and who wanted what? Or was Northumbria Scottish or English? William the Lion meets with his lords on the 24th of May in Stirling, Scotland, hoping to hammer out this new deal. Unfortunately, as ever with the Mercurial John, the mood changes. And when the Scottish ambassadors arrive at the King's court at Arundel, John is baying for the lion's blood. Apparently, William the Lion was making deals with Philip Augustus. Another conspiracy for John to discover. The English King was his usual happy self. He's moved on from having kittens. He's got several litters. This is something else. Soon John's demanding hostages from the Scottish King his eldest son. Reminder, William the Lion is not John the subject, he's the king of a sovereign state. John's gone potty, for lack of a better word. I've exhausted all the others. This refusal leads to threats of war. Roger of Wendover writes that the king, John, having assembled a great army, directed his banners and might towards Scotland. And soon John's army arrives at Norham in early August. This great army faced off with a huge force of Scots that had assembled at Roxburgh, just south of Edinburgh. Although the dour Scottish king hadn't come to fight, he was too old, too ill. He was here to submit to the English king, probably hoping John would see some sense. He had no such grace. Instead, the Scottish Lion was subjected to humiliating terms, which included his two teenage daughters offering hands in marriage. Margaret was to marry his toddling son, Henry. 13 hostages, 15,000 marks. Humiliation. This was the price of peace. Herbert John was about to suffer humiliation of his own from the one man higher than he. Pope Innocent III. Now, currently the kingdom was under an interdict. John was threatened with the taste of full excommunication, the real deal, the big one, no more fun and games. 
and on the 9th of August, Stephen Langton, the Archbishop of Canterbury, was sent forth to enter England against John's wishes with all the exiled monks of the church compensated. Even now, John didn't care. In Scotland, Ireland and Wales, he'd got his own way every single time. And by late August, he's still stalling with the clergy, probably convinced he'll never suffer innocence full wrath. But it's looking like excommunication is imminent. This could allow his enemies to invade with blessing from the Pope. John leaves his exchequer in Northampton and heads for Marlborough in Wiltshire, writing to Langton, claiming to want to discuss the situation, a private meeting in Dover. John starts sending letters to every sheriff from Kent to Cumbria. An oath of loyalty was demanded. He summoned all and sundry at Marlborough Castle in September 1209. Every man from 15 and upwards, mostly freemen, and focusing on London townspeople. Tens of thousands turned up. It must have felt like the biblical Roman census. This was a mass migration. All arrived at Marlborough, all swore fealty, both to John and his toddling son Henry. Kneeling before him, fealty. The Oath of Marlborough. All full fines were slapped on anyone who didn't heed John's call. Dark times, indeed. He's acting more like a mafia boss. Joe Peschke from Goodfellas. A narcissistic psychopath. Meanwhile, Stephen Langton has taken up John's offer to meet him in Dover and hoped to meet the, with the King at Chilham Castle. He waited and waited, but the King didn't turn up. It was John's final chance at salvation. There was no other choice. After having been given so many chances, King John was finally fully excommunicated in October 1209. Cardinal Stephen Langton, along with all the bishops in the kingdom, sailed back to France where they waited out the interdict. And these were dark times indeed. No sacraments. John was happy ransacking their lands, swelling his already bloated coffers. There was no way he was going to budge. And at the Christmas court that was held in Windsor that year, two men were notably absent. William Marshall, who had remained in Ireland, and William de Bros, the fugitive, who remained at large. <laughs> 